Hello, everyone. Welcome back to your Sacred Sexy Life. I'm Anahita Jun, your host, and I am so thrilled to be sitting here today with Veronica Monet. I'm seriously so excited for you guys to experience her. Veronica is the founder of Shame, the Shame Free Zone. She's also the creator of Exquisite Partnership. You may have seen her on CNN or Fox or have read about her in the New York Times. I will let Veronica tell you a little bit about herself and then we can dive right in. Cool. Well, uh, I'm a certified sexologist. And by the way, I'm so glad you're putting this on. I just want to say that first. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this to the world. And I I love your juicy, sexy, sacred energy around this. So thank you so much. Thank you for that. I'm a certified sexologist. I've been working as a relationship coach for over 10 years now. And before that, I authored a book called Sex Secrets of Escorts. And before that, I was an escort for 14 years while I was married and had children and had a college education. So um, (laughs) that's one of the reasons I got all the media exposure. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was very vocal, sex worker rights activist. I'm still a sex worker rights activist. Um, Most of my work now is one-on-one. And every once in a while, I get politically uh, motivated, like when they're trying to pass some anti-trafficking uh, measure here in the state of California. I went to speak to Stanford University just a couple of years ago. So, um, so that's, a, that's a vibrant part of my life, and it kind of helps us segue into a topic that's near and dear to my heart, which is slut shaming. <laughs> yes, slut shaming and shame in general, right? right. The shame so, free zone. Yeah, I have to tell you cool. what it felt like the first time I went on your website. I was like, oh, the shame free zone. Oh, it was just like a, it felt like a hall pass, but a really loving one. <laughs> oh, good well, one. I'm just so happy to hear that because love is what I'm all about. Yeah. But love. Yeah. And I, it pains me that we still have people who, um, I think really kind of you know, worship violence um, to such an extent that sex is kind of antithetic to violence. And, and if you don't believe that, you should learn a lot about a little animal called the bonobo. And uh, it's one of our closest cousins. They're very polyamorous, pansexual. Um, they love sex and that's how they solve their conflicts. And uh, unfortunately, we're more like chimpanzees. We declare wars and commit murders and do all kinds of infanticide, great murder and war. So <laughs> we, we are evolving and that's and that's yeah. what this that's we, what this interview is all about. Evolving. So I, yeah. I so anyway, I want to send everybody out to go Google Bonobo, B-O-N-O-B-O, Bonobo. That they are the ultimate anti-shame free no, That's what they are. They're all about shame free. There you have it, everyone. Bonobo. So what is a slut? That's always a question. Isn't it? It's really just an excuse to hurt somebody, um, mm-hmm. because there isn't actually one definition of slut. Um, if you get labeled that term, just like the term whore, then they can do anything they want to you. Mm-hmm. Now, it's used against primarily women. Um, every once in a while, it maybe is kind of jokingly towards men. But I remember one time when I was speaking at Stanford University, I did a little experiment. I asked the students, I said, so I want all the guys in here to think about the last time somebody called you a whore. And uh, you'll notice I use both these terms, slut and whore, kind of interchangeably. And I know that's that's kind of a little shocking for some people, but bear with me. Um, all the guys kind of giggled and elbowed each other. It was funny because somebody had said, oh, you're a man whore at some mm-hmm. point. It wasn't a big deal. And then I asked all the women in the room to think about the first time somebody called them a whore and the, the room got deathly silent. There's nothing funny about it. Nothing funny about it. There's actually young girls who, because of slut shaming, um, have on social media, have committed suicide, quite a few of them. Yeah. And, and, and if you don't believe me, go over to the shamefreezone.com and uh, check out my blog roll because I've, I've written about it extensively. So it's, it's a big deal. Um, it costs women their lives. And for the rest of us who may never be even sexually harassed, let alone raped or beaten or anything like that behind that term, um, it creates a sense of fear. So that we're all confused. What is a slut? Well, I think the reason that we don't know 
is because that's what keeps us afraid. And I'm here to say, let's stop being afraid. So uh, a long time ago, I came up with an acronym for slut. Sluts, actually, plural, because I think it's always about the we, not the me. So sluts, in my book, stands for sexually liberated, unique, talented sister. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sexually liberated, unique, talented sister. That's a slut. Oh, but, that's really good. Yeah. That's, that's so good. loving. That's so loving. And put the plural on the end there that brings us together uh, and unifies us in solidarity rather than us trying to figure out, okay, which one of us is the slut, right? And so yeah. that's kind of how that term is used, just kind of to divide. So slut shaming is another form of sexual shaming. And, um, you know, a lot of sexual shaming does seem to accrue towards women. And I think this is one of the things that women are doing. We are bringing the divine feminine back. We're really bringing that powerful archetype back. And yeah. she's very sexual. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at our beautiful Mother Earth, there's not a single creative thing that happens on this planet that isn't born of sex. And I, and I would argue that even the Big Bang Theory, which birthed the universe, was sex. But anyway... That might be a little far out for some. I think I think that's that, that's gonna be a <laughs> conversation that's going to be longer. But maybe we'll have it offline and decide if we want to bring it back online. Okay. Um, but yeah, definitely, it's aliveness, right? It's it's the. It's I, I, I do feel like we're taking it back. I feel like we're we're taking back and reclaiming that power, and that's what this this conversation is really dedicated to: is really taking back the power so that there isn't room for the power to be manipulated and handled and just tossed from side to side. I think it's so important to contextualize our sexuality in a holistic framework so that it's not off into what I call the sexual ghetto. So that we're not just thinking, okay, well, if I'm sexual, that must mean that I'm having sex. No, it doesn't have to mean that at all. Maybe I'll go build a bridge or write a book or Paint a painting. That's when you're fully sexually activated, when that energy and that chi, when that kundalini, that coiled serpent at the base of your spine is shooting up through all the chakras, you are so alive and you're so creative and you're so juicy. And yes. that's the sacred sexy expression to me. It's yes. really not seeing it holistically. When we get into things which compartmentalize, um, or, or even, you know, which a lot of times are our mainstream media and modern, you know, pornography tends to put sex in a context that I think, um, cuts us up into little pieces, doesn't allow us to be a whole person. And that may seem like it's very specific to women, but I think it also occurs to men. There's ways in which we're not connecting our hearts and our spirits and our, our spirituality to our sexuality. And when we do that, that's when we're, we are, I think, the most fully realized and the most fully alive. Yeah. That's really exciting to me. The ancients used to call sex a doorway to the divine. Yes. And it is. It absolutely is. I think if you want to have a truly um, activated, dynamic spiritual life, you've got to connect it to your sexuality. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Amen, sister. <laughs> so I know we wanted to talk a little bit more about shame. And shame, because people do have and they experience shame and, in regards to sex. Well, shame is something that we feel about ourselves. And it could be anything. It could be body shame, shame about our uh, income level, shame about our educational level, shame about our, our race, our gender, all kinds of things to evoke shame. Sexual shame, to me, is a very special kind of shame because it's probably the most taboo one. It is the one that evokes um, the, the largest degree of secrecy, I think, uh, mm -hmm. and isolation. People are really afraid to talk about their sexuality. Now, they might talk about sex, but you really talk about their insecurities, their fears, uh, their desires, that becomes uh, pretty taboo. Um, 
And it depends, again, on how you're comparing yourself from generation to generation. Certainly, there's been times when sex was more in the open and times when it's been a little more closeted. We happen to be in a time right now where it seems like it's really out in the open. But what it seems to have to me is kind of a, a little bit of a, uh, a veneer to a hardened veneer to it. Like we may have um, the permission to talk about a particular sexual technique, but we don't seem to have permission to really explore the emotional terrain. Yeah. 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 I really hear you. I really hear you on all of that. And, and what you were saying about the, the shame around, around it, what was, what was coming forward was, yes, the difference between shame and guilt, but also what was coming forward was all the great religions of the world, most of them anyway, most of the, the ones that are in the forefront of yes. our awareness. Well, and I think there's a huge difference between religion and spirituality. I think yeah. spirituality really asks us to develop a personal relationship with the divine and religion um, asks us to kind of abdicate that connection and let somebody else interpret it for us. And consequently, we're handing the keys over to a mortal human being who may or may not know what resonates best for us. Yeah. Um, and oftentimes, unfortunately, religion still kind of harks back to its original purpose, which wasn't really about spirituality. It was about government. Religion. And control, yeah. So government, the first government was religion, so we, we kind of still have that. Uh, and I think human beings are trying to evolve to make religion more about spirituality, but we really need to acknowledge the roots and, and then look at to, to understand why there's this shame. Shame is a great way to control people. Uh, you shut them down. You cause them to feel like they don't deserve. Uh, they lose their ability to speak for themselves, and uh, they become very docile and easily manipulated. So, if you're trying to break out of sexual shame, you want to work in reverse. Okay, and and there's a whole bunch of tools that I have in my toolbox. I'd like to share with you viewers. Um, some of them may call to them more than others. For myself, I started my journey and healing my sexual shame by learning about the history of human sexuality. And as I became more acquainted with the fact that it's, it's never been one way, there's always been different types of sexual expression on this planet. Um, when I found out that the Greek, uh, got, you know, the Greek social structure was really predicated on homosexual relationships. And then, and then I found out about the ancient sacred prostitution temples mm -hmm. and, and then I found out about these tantric temples in India where it, it's a sacred holy place that you're entering and it's just all kinds of sex on the walls when I, when I really got to understand that the most amazing thing going on planet earth at one point was the birth of a human being and that therefore women's genitalia were worshipped and women's bodies were worshipped just changed the whole game for me. Yeah. It opened my eyes to all this diversity and permission that we had lost somewhere along the line. The other thing that really helped me was, of course, finding out that some of the more um, peaceful um, cultures on this planet, where, whether it's the bonobos or some of the indigenous cultures like the Maswa in China, you find out that they're predicated upon um, sexual permission rather than sexual prohibition. There's there's an attitude towards sex that it's, that it's good and that women have this, this choice and this power to make those decisions for themselves without being slut-shamed uh, or punished or owned. And that those cultures tend to be uh, more nonviolent than the ones that, that really predominate this planet. And if you look at the really oppressive regimes on this planet, almost all of them are sex phobic. So that's a really good thing to also be noticing. Yeah. So after you educate yourself, the next thing is you've really got to find support groups. You've got to find other people who are trying to break free of their shame so you share your stories. And today, you can find a lot of those people online. You can start a blog and find people that would follow you. You can find all kinds of people that are sex positive on your Twitter feed. And, and you just expand your world that way. And you start to change 
what feels normal or acceptable to you. And it starts to create all this, this room for you to explore. And that's the third thing. You want to explore, experiment a little bit. Find out what really calls to you, what you like, what you don't like, um, and give yourself permission not to like things. Because here's another thing. When people become real sex positive, sometimes they become ashamed that they don't like a particular form of sex. You can just take your shame from something repressive into a really permissive environment, and then you're going to still feel ashamed. So, ultimately, is there such a thing as healthy shame? I don't believe there is. No, there's two schools of thought on this, and I tend to be more in the Brene Brown camp. Brene Brown absolutely positively says there's there's shame, there's guilt, guilt can be a good thing. It can be an indicator to your conscience that you've done something that you don't want to do and that you need to go fix that, make it amends, change your behavior. So it's, it is great to have a conscience, but shame attacks your, your core. Shame is not about what you've done. Shame is about who you are. And sexual shame is so, it's so crippling because yeah. we're we, we hear that we're born sexual. I'm here to tell you you were sexual before you were born. Okay? We have now got sonograms and ultrasounds that are showing fetuses masturbating to the point of orgasm in the womb. Wow. Yeah. So your sexuality, mm-hmm. it's such an important part of you. It's It happened before your first breath of air, before your first sip of mother's milk, before your first bite of food, before your first... Uh, step your your first word and so if you can't acknowledge that your sexuality comes first that that is your core then then you're missing a huge part of yourself and so that's why sexual shame is so destructive because it's attacking the very center of your being so um no i i think shame you know Brene brown also says i keep quoting her because she's a she's like the shame expert okay um she should look her up. She's got great TED Talks. Yeah. The empath- empathy is the antidote to shame. Really yes. Is. So, so you want to get uh, connected to yourself emotionally and really validate your feelings. And if your feelings are that you want to be asexual, or that you want to be promiscuous, or that you may be a little curious about experimenting with some forms of sex like BDSM, or maybe you're a little bi-curious, um, maybe you want to do some swinging, any of that stuff. You want to give yourself permission to explore that safely. You should get like some training, some education. There's so many great workshops out there. There's no reason, or you can come to a sexologist like myself. There's no reason to, to go into these things blindly. Um, there's so much that you're saying. I just want to pause you because there's so much that's coming forward that I want to like, I want to unpack yeah. some of it. Yes. Um, one of them just went, but it will probably come back. But, oh, because we're talking about being sexually um, activated and the, and that, the aliveness that comes with that. And then you mentioned, well, giving yourself permission to be asexual. Yeah. So, so what, yeah, can we talk what about that? that? Like? What would that? Well, everybody kind of defines asexuality different. For some people, it kind of denotes a certain level of abstinence and for others it's like well they just don't feel any sexual desire for another human being but they masturbate um uh, and and for still others there may not be any sexual desire at all um so again self-definition is so important but if you're interested in that concept of abstinence and or asexuality i I think that's a valuable and an important part of your sexual journey I like to think of sex as something that's not static. And so if I've been abstinent, I've gone long periods of time without sex. And it was fabulous. Uh Just fabulous because I turned my sexual energies towards other creative and and passionate pursuits. And and that's a beautiful use of that energy. But I knew it was sexual energy. I wasn't trying to deny that. And and I honor that. I, I respect that. And then if I want to bring that sexual energy into alignment with union with another person, I can do that as well. Or I can make it about my own uh, private uh, solo experience. Now, we call that masturbation. I like to call it meditation. 
I think that when we are pleasuring ourselves and, and especially you know, since, since this webinar is about it being sacred, I, yeah. I, I have, you know, a ritual around that that is really dear to me. And, and usually it's like you would start off with maybe some aesthetic dancing or yoga, something to get your body moving. You put on your favorite mantra music or metaphysical music or some kind of spiritual music. Um, I don't want it to be romantic music because that gets you thinking about the other. And you want, you want to go in and connect with yourself and with the divine. And, and you, can, you can do prayer and affirmation, create a visualization, light some incense, some candles. Yeah. Um, Wear wait. something beautiful. Yes. Yeah. And, and yeah. orgasm actually doesn't have to be about a sexual fantasy. Orgasm, I have found, is a great way to grieve. It's a great way to release those emotions and allow them to fully leave your body. And orgasm is a fabulous way to bring in the things that you want, whether it's prosperity or the love of your life. Your, your brain is more open at the moment of orgasm than it's going to be any, any other time. So if you yes. can use that, that um, place as a, a way to catalyze what you want to bring, you could say it's kind of a form of sex magic in some ways. But um, I, I call it meditation. Well, this is great. I, I love this because, um, yeah. So what you what you're speaking about, I just I want us to go a little bit more into that as well. You know, 10, 12 years ago, I sat in front of one of the most well known spiritual teachers, and I said, I got to ask the question. I you know, and I said, tell me how I can use the moment of orgasm climax to create what I want. Wow. And yeah. I know it's, it's, it's so now doing this, it's amazing that I asked that question that I was even bold enough to go and ask. Oh, oh my God. Yes. Yeah. But I knew, I knew I was onto something. I for sure knew it. And, and what they said was different, but what you're saying now, they just said, well, that's the most open that you are. So you want to be as open as you want to just use that space to remain open so that the blessings of life can be showered upon you. Right. So tell us about what you're speaking about. And I, I am actually talking about using going into your, your meditation masturbation practice with um, creative visualization as your goal. So mm. you, you would be um, thinking about world peace or the, um, the company that you want to build or the book that you want to write or the, the baby that you want to birth or the man or the woman that you want to pull into your life or that um, amazing world travel that you've always dreamed of or it, something like that. Maybe taking on a new sport that's really got you scared. You're thinking you can't take it on, but, you know, whatever that might be. In my case, it would probably be skydiving. Um, <laughs> you to be actually thinking about those things, visualizing the thing that you're wanting to evoke and to bring into your life. It might just be taking uh, your workout to another level or your health to another level, or you're actually visualizing yourself as the place you want to be a year from now. And now so I, want to, I want to ask you something because I hear what you're saying and I feel like it's important to distinguish the difference between the visualization and the feeling, because for me, so I'm, I'm receiving this as, as for myself. And yeah. I, I feel like it would be for me in that space, it's much easier to feel into the feeling mm -hmm. what I want, like the feeling of abundance or the feeling of more leadership or the feeling of more health. Yes. And, you know, it's kind of like getting people, um, kind of like what the secret did was like, oh, if you just put everything on a vision board, it will come true and kind of want oh. to unpack that. Yeah. 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 See, I, when I was studying, Shakti Gawain wrote a, a book about, and I probably just mangled her last name, but she wrote a, uh, a book about creative visualization a long, long time ago, which I read. And I, I'm coming from this place of not just thinking about it in your head, um, or putting a picture on a vision board, but literally stepping into it with feeling. And it's a little difficult sometimes to completely open to those feelings. Mm -hmm. When you are in the throes of sexual pleasure, and at that 
women of orgasm, you're going to be a, a lot better at really feeling what that would feel like. You're going to feel the exhilaration and the excitement and really allow yourself to move into that with passion. So I'm, I'm absolutely talking about the feeling part of that. Yeah, and I think that's why it's so important to begin with the dance, the movement, so that we are open to going there, which is which is what Absolutely. you're talking about. Yes, and, yeah. and when you're talking about um, making love to yourself, you, you really show up in a way that's respectful and adoring. And too often times, I think people just kind of shovel food in their mouth and um, maybe um, masturbate real quick so they can go to sleep. There's ways in which we just keep um, kind of disrespecting ourselves over and over again. Mm -hmm. And to really slow down and and eroticize everything. I mean, give yourself a foot massage or a hand massage or both. Um, take a beautiful, luxurious bath. Um, eat a food that you really, really love or drink a beverage that you really, really love. Surround yourself with tastes and sights and smells that, that really... Um, Make you feel beloved. That's really the space that you want to move into. Is that I am my own beloved. And at that point, if you wanted to evoke the sacred, you also, there is a natural desire to want to merge with. And this is why so often we have the fantasy of merging with another human being. Which is my, in my opinion, that is an absolutely gorgeous, beautiful, wonderful, amazing, miraculous thing. But it should start with merging with yourself and the divine. If you can can really bring that into your sexuality, you will be much more adept at merging with a human being. But if you're in that moment of passion just before you have your orgasm and you're thinking, oh, I really want to merge. If you can evoke a concept of the divine that is just as sexy and juicy and sacred as you want to be, and really allow that energy to come in, it's going to lift you right off the surface of this planet. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I love that. Um, I think we have a few more minutes and I want I just, so there's something that came forward a little while ago and I do want to cover it because we were also talking about shame and we're kind of going back and forth a lot. So yes. Yes. just wanting to get as much as I can out of you for our audience. I'm all for it. <laughs> um, so you were speaking about, you know, allowing yourself to be educated and explore and what was coming forward was say someone does want to swing or someone does want to explore polyamory. Right. What would you suggest in terms of how would they speak to their partner about that if that wasn't set up from the beginning? Say if they're in a committed relationship or a marriage and, and that wasn't set up from the beginning, how would they create the safe space to A, release the shame and also really be in a loving dialogue? The very first step should be education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sex is not something that comes natural. It does as far as self-pleasuring comes natural in the womb. Yes. And then when we are outside the womb, we start to perfect that self-exploration a little bit more. Some of us do, some of us don't. I myself, I was raised in a Christian cult and didn't until I was 18. But <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I just put that in there. I don't want anybody full of shame if they didn't. Okay. Because there's yes. no shame here. But um, and then we kind of fumble around when we start having partnered sex and we gradually kind of learn maybe what our partner likes and what we like. But I just think the sex is so important that we should be investing in learning about it. And I'm not talking about the kind of dry nonsense they teach in schools or what you find in a textbook. I'm talking about yes. juicy, amazing, exciting classes that you can take if you get um, into a workshop. So I know that in, that's going to be more accessible in urban areas like San Francisco or New York or Los Angeles. You can always find workshops on polyamory. You can find workshops on um, BDSM. You can find workshops on just about anything that you have any interest in. And you can also find support groups and other communities and people that want to connect. Um, so that's a really the best way to start. If you happen to be in an a area where you don't have access to that, like I live in Nevada City and we don't have those kind of groups and workshops, um, 
So you have to kind of travel out to the Bay Area to do that. So people uh, find what they want meaning online a lot of times. There's so much online as well. So, yeah. There are. There's Tantra classes online. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you can get DVDs um, or, you know, streaming. Yeah. It. As far as broaching the topic with your partner, um, that education is going to give you language to speak about it. Uh, instead of kind of fumbling around going, uh, uh, I was kind of, I don't know, what do you think? Oops, sorry, I brought it up. Um, <laughs> you'll, feel, you'll feel a little more empowered. You'll actually yeah. say, I was online, and, I, and, and it helps to be able to say that there's other people doing this. Um, it helps you break for your sexual shame, and it helps your partner contextualize your desire and the framework of, ah, it's not just something weird that I came up with. There's there's whole communities doing this. And would you be willing to go to one of these workshops with me? Would you be willing to go to one of these events with me? Would you be willing to go to one of these meet and greets? I don't want to go alone. I would really would like you to go with me so we can then figure out what we think. We can come home, compare notes, talk about it. And that's really where the explorations should start. Because I'll tell you, too often what happens is people are ashamed. They start experimenting on their own. They may cheat, start engaging in behavior. Then they try to introduce it to their partner, who by this time already kind of knows there's uh, some kind of a disconnect in this relationship. We're not talking about something, and you haven't told me something. You're going to get a hostile reaction. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So invite invite and and this is uh actually something i teach couples uh five steps to exquisite partnership and and that last step that i teach is inviting your partner into um things rather than um kind of coming at them with oh this is what i want to do um Mm. it's more like you want to be a good salesperson you want to bring all your excitement <laughs> if, you, if you bring your fear oh i know you're going to say no or oh i guess it's bad that i'm thinking this that's what people will react to but if you're mm-hmm. like oh my god i love this book it's just amazing and it's, i find it so hot and your partner says wow that's really foreign to me they're still going to be a little more intrigued and curious, but the fact that you're so alive. so turned on, yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. There you have it, everyone. Educate yourselves. Great sacred space. Be open with your partners. But really, Veronica has a special gift for you. So I want you to tell us about that. Yes, I do. I would really like you to go over to theshamefreezone.com. And I've got two gifts. Thanks so much, Veronica. And I know you have a gift for our audience. I do. I would. I have a special gift just for your viewers. And it's my um, ebook on how you can stop fighting and love your relationship more than ever. And uh, the link for that is at the bottom of this page for the webinar. So I hope you'll click on that and download it right now. Yes. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Veronica. Bye.